<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Korb, and on behalf of my colleagues uh, here at the uh, Center for American Progress, I'd like to welcome you to what I think will be a, a, a very, very <clears throat> important discussion on an issue that's uh, facing the country right now, the question of uh, modernizing our, uh, our, our nuclear arsenal. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, sad news. Ellen Tauscher, you know, ha had some problem, uh, health problems this morning, so she will not be able to make it. Uh, the, the, unfortunately, I've been drafted to be the third panelist here uh, uh, up there this morning. Um, <clears throat> I, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all of the uh, people who made this report uh, and the interactive, which I'll discuss in a minute, um, uh, uh, possible. First, uh, <coughs> Plowshares Fund, Joe Serincioni and Tom Kalina for helping us and funding this project and, <coughs> and coming up uh, with the idea. <coughs> My former colleague, uh, Kate Blakely, who was the one who started this and, 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 and pushed it uh, uh, down the road until she uh, left. Uh, Meredith Leal, who stepped in for Kate, and uh, <coughs> Eric Goebel, who helped uh, with all the logistics to get this. Uh, art and editorial, uh, you, because not only did the editorial have to go over our writing and make sure everything was okay, but developing uh, the interactive was quite a Herculean, uh, Herculean task. Uh, and uh, I'd like to Billy uh, Flanagan and the events team for uh, coordinate, coordinating this. Now, <clears throat> when you speak nuclear about nuclear weapons, one of the problems is it's very hard for the American people, the average person who's not focusing on these uh, issues, to understand what's going on. So in addition to <clears throat> the report, we've developed this uh, interactive, which allows you, and uh, if we could, Alex, put it on there, uh, to compare <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, what the administration uh, wants, uh, and uh, compare that to what we recommend. And it also allows the man or woman <clears throat> who's interested in this, who doesn't spend all their time focusing <clears throat> on these issues, to make their own recommendation. Do you want, you know, X amount of uh, bombers or missiles or, or submarines? And, you know, what, uh, what, can, you, uh, what can you save? And we have a URL that's be available, obviously, to you folks or anybody who wants to uh, wants to do it. Last week, when my co-author Adam and I were at uh, Plowshares briefing this, uh, <clears throat> one of the people from the Physicians of Social Responsibility said, "You know, this is great. Our members who don't follow this, you know, specifically, will be able to go on and 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 do that." So I do think that this is really a groundbreaking way to get people involved. Uh, in this debate because, unfortunately, I think people think with the end of the Cold War it's over and we don't have to be concerned about this as much as, uh, <clears throat> as we used to. Now, <clears throat> in this report, uh, <clears throat> we do uh, a, a, couple, uh, a, cu a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> we point out uh, in the, that this, the current nuclear uh, structure that you have was not ordained from on high. In other words, that Going, developing the force that we have was a function of uh, <clears throat> politics, uh, <clears throat> analysis, debates, like most other weapon systems that are developed by the, uh, by the, by the de uh, Department of Defense. And we relied on the works of a lot of people who've been focusing on this for years, people like Steve Schwartz and Harvey Sapolsky. And <clears throat> I also relied on a lot of interviews that I did when I first got involved in writing about the role of the military in making foreign policy, I was privileged uh, to uh, interview a lot of people dealing with these uh, uh, particular, particular uh, subjects. <clears throat> people like Arlie Burke, those of you familiar with uh, Todd's new employer, CSIS, you have the Burke chair. Well, when I interviewed him, Burke was there. And we spoke about, uh, you know, the Polaris uh, submarine. And, and Melvin Laird, who was my mentor when I first came to town here, we spoke about the Trident program and <clears throat> all of the roles he had there as well as, uh, as, as looking at the, the number of uh, bombers when he was dealing with the, the budget crunch basically in the, uh, in the 1970s. 
Uh, second thing we point out uh, is that <clears throat> you cannot undo the modernization plan that's on the books now that seems uh, that everybody wants to support without <clears throat> undermining other capabilities in the Department of Defense. It involves trade-offs. And while people say, well, quote, unquote, it's not that expensive, to a certain extent, if you build <clears throat> a submarine that's uh, a nuclear powered, can you build your conventional or can you build as many, uh, you know, F-35s <clears throat> as, as, uh, as you might like? And then the final thing uh, we did was our proposals, which uh, Adam is going to get to here in a second, basically stay within the new start levels. But we do make recommendations that will allow the next administration, whoever she or he may be, to make more radical changes than we propose if, if uh, he or she decides to do that. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, turn it over to my uh, colleague and co-author, Adam uh, Bauer. So I'd like to echo uh, Larry's thanks to CAP uh, and also to the Plowshares Fund for supporting this research. Uh, we start, as Larry says, from the premise that uh, budgeting and procuring nuclear weapons is a political process, like in other areas of, of the DOD budget uh, and, and in other areas of politics. It's not immune from political pressures. It never has been, and it's not likely to be this time. And so as we construct a plan to modernize the nuclear arsenal, it's important to uh, take into account these, these political pressures and put in place a realistic plan to modernize the triad. Uh, we've got to be uh, very clear and we've got to uh, be realistic that uh, the overwhelming trend in major defense acquisition programs is for the services to request uh, large purchases and then for Congress to winnow these requests subsequently. It's, it's not likely that we end up spending a trillion dollars over 30 years modernizing the triad. This just isn't what history supports. Therefore, uh, we don't want nuclear force structure made by congressional accident. We don't want it to be made by uh, whatever, by canceling or modifying whatever systems happen to face cost overruns. Uh, Larry and I believe very seriously that the nuclear arsenal should be a, a product of rational strategy. It ought to be a strategy-driven uh, modernization plan. But to do that, you need to take into account likely budgetary pressures. So we outline a, a set of plans to, uh, th that we think can meet uh, and help us stay at the New START warhead levels, can maintain a triad, but by uh, modifying the, plan, the plans within each leg of the triad, it helps us to achieve real savings that can protect the core systems and the core capabilities that we think are important uh, to maintain in our triad going forward. Uh, and so uh, there are a couple of steps that this president, the outgoing president, can take. Uh, so, so the major effort in, in uh, reviewing or discussing the nuclear modernization plans should be as a part of the nuclear posture review uh, taken at the beginning of the next administration. But there are a couple of steps that this outgoing administration should take. Uh, I, I think there's a very real concern today that President Obama doesn't want to box in or constrain his successor. Uh, I, I think it, it ought to be uh, a question for the next administration, and President Obama and his White House are, are, uh, are realistic about the fact that they don't want to uh, constrain this effort. But at the same time, we have to recognize that if we don't take some steps now, it will also place constraints on, on, the, on the next administration. So for instance, as a first step, uh, President Obama should order uh, a comprehensive review of these modernization plans, gather the data, do the budget analysis that's necessary to inform the next nuclear posture review. It should be ready on day one for the next administration as they take office, so that they're not forced to be gathering this information as they're trying to review the budget. Uh, and the modernization plans. Uh, so this, this review ought to uh, include cost estimates of the modernization plans, uh, have a briefing on, each, on the role of each strategic system, and uh, also include the effects of, other, of, of these nuclear plans on other conventional modernization programs, which we'll talk about on the panel. 
uh, we should be very, uh, there should be good information waiting for the next president on what these trade-offs are going to be. Secondly, uh, President Obama, as he's leaving, uh, leaving office, can uh, alter or revise guidance or requirements that help drive planning for nuclear modernization. And in this uh, sense, we want to highlight uh, two issues in particular. Uh, the presi this president, for instance, can, with a stroke of a pen, revise re patrol requirements for SSBNs that currently keep the Navy from uh, considering or doing the analysis necessary to see what whether we could uh, satisfy our nation's deterrent requirements with fewer than 12 planned uh, ballistic missile submarines. Uh, secondly, uh, the pre this outgoing president can also order the Air Force uh, to plan or at least preserve the option to incrementally modernize the Minuteman ICBM force. Uh, there are uh, this year and in the next couple of years, uh, uh, the Air Force is planning to switch over its research and development funding to start to explore uh, replacing the Minuteman ICBM rather than continuing, continuing to incrementally modernize it in place. Uh, modernizing the ICBM in place would be a major cost-saving step. Uh, it's not necessary, we believe, uh, to maintain deterrence uh, to replace the ICBM. In fact, it would be a tremendous outlay that doesn't add a lot of strategic benefit. And so uh, this president, as, as this White House is closing down, shouldn't forestall or shouldn't constrain that decision uh, in the next nuclear posture review. Uh, lastly, this White House can take steps to cancel or at the very least pause uh, two uh, major outstanding uh, programs. These are the program to consolidate the B-61 gravity uh, tactical nuclear bomb in, uh, to, to move it from four variants into one variant, the B-6112, uh, as well as the long-range standoff missile. These programs are moving very quickly. Uh, in the case of the B-61, towards production units very soon. Uh, by the time the next nuclear posture review is done, these programs will have uh, two more years under their, under their belts, and they'll be uh, very difficult to, mod to modify or to cancel later. So in order to uh, allow the next administration the flexibility to make these decisions, uh, we believe this president ought to um, pause, at the very least, these programs and probably to cancel them outright. Uh, the additional strategic benefits of the long-range standoff weapon, uh, a cruise missile to replace the air-launched cruise missile, and the B-6112 gravity bomb, uh, which now has uh, reportedly about 180 units stationed in Europe, are marginal. Uh, we believe that these are not core systems necessary for deterrence, but in fact they're niche systems uh, that can help with um, a, cu a couple of highly tenuous and very specific um, uh, deterrence problems, but in fact they're simply not worth the cost. And so, when the next administration takes office, the nuclear posture review, uh, one of the major questions that it should, it, it should consider is what we're doing with the submarine force, uh, the, the fleet of SSBNs, the ballistic missile submarines that serve as the very core of this nation's deterrent. So if we could see the subplan. Uh, the current plans under the, under the Navy uh, vary the number of operational SSBNs over the next two or three decades. So for instance, as the current Ohio ballistic missile submarines are finishing their refueling cycles and their mid-career refits, uh, the Navy expects the number of operational submarines to increase from 12 to 14 in the next couple of years. Uh, and then thereafter, they plan to decline uh, gradually to uh, 10 operational submarines in 2032. Uh, Larry and I uh, take a look at this, and it's our view that if it's possible to meet deterrence requirements with 10 submarines, then this should be the level of the force. It's not necessary to vary around this cap, and in fact, we can uh, have enough warhead slots on 10 submarines in order to keep us at the new start ceiling. Uh, and so our view is if 10 is sufficient to, re uh, to meet requirements, then that's where we should be. Uh, we should get there in the next couple of years and stay there rather than uh, varying the number of submarines. And this is, a, this is one of those points where it's important to be 
uh, realistic about what we can and cannot afford and what Congress is likely to appropriate funding for. Uh, after we've stayed at 10 submarines for eight years, I, I think it's difficult to uh, believe that Congress would be interested in appropriating funds to raise that level subsequently, uh, especially with all of the other very pressing con conventional weapon systems going on. So we believe collectively these steps would save about $120, million, $120 billion over the next 24 years. Uh, this is uh, funding that we can reinvest into the conventional systems that help to deter Russia, help to fight terrorists, and help to uh, keep our nation safe every day. These are assets that we do use every day. Uh, at the same time, these savings can help to protect the core systems that are necessary for the nuclear deterrent. And furthermore, they can go to deficit reduction and a reduction in the size of the defense budget overall, which currently stands at uh, fairly high levels historically. Uh, so to discuss these uh, proposals and to give us some background on the history of uh, nuclear weapons modernization and a perspective on where we stand today, I'd like you to join me in welcoming uh, a panel of experts to the stage. So to my far right is General U Eugene Habiger, uh, former commander of U.S. Strategic Command, who after retiring uh, from, the, from the U.S. Air Force as a command B-52 pilot, uh, also served in the Department of Energy where he helped to uh, stand up programs on nuclear security. Uh, next is Todd Harrison, a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where he serves as the director of budget, the budget analysis program. Uh, he came to CSIS from the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments and prior to that worked at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, Larry Korb, to my direct right, is my co-author on the report. Uh, he formerly held the Maurice R. Greenberg Chair at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he, hel he helped to, dir to direct national security studies. Uh, in the Reagan administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense. So gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, we're very pleased to have this distinguished panel. Uh, General Habiger, I wonder if you could give us your perspective on uh, what we need as a nation to deter our adversaries in the next coming years. Are we in the right place? Uh, are there systems that we're missing? Are there systems where we're overinvested? And how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> got about an hour. <laughs> got about an hour. <laughs> well, I certainly won't take that much time, but thank you. Okay. And thank you, Larry, for setting this up and inviting me to come up from San Antonio, where it was 80 degrees on Sunday, so. Uh, <laughs> we apologize for that. Uh, this ain't a whole lot of fun. Well, first of all, I'm a little bit surprised that, uh, and don't take this personally, that we talk about deterring Russia. Uh, the Cold War has been over for 25 years now. Uh, and I would submit, as I've had, I have for several years, that our nuclear weapons are not deterring Russia or China, they're defer deterring nuclear weapons. If we could eliminate nuclear weapons day after tomorrow, then uh, in, in their entirety, then I say go to zero right away. Uh, but that's not going to happen. We're still going to have a requirement for nuclear weapons as long as there are nuclear weapons around. And there are going to be nuclear weapons uh, on the planet for decades, if not centuries to come. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir now, but the most important element of our government is to ensure our safety and security. Well, as long as there's nuclear weapons out there, uh, you're going to have to uh, have something in kind. So I would submit we're not deterring Russia or China or uh, any other country, but we're uh, deterring other nuclear weapons. This is uh, a dynamic time we're living in. And I, as I told the folks earlier, uh, I have gone to great lengths not to involve myself in the political process up to this point because there's just so much going on, it's noise. Uh, it's an important part of our political process. The, uh, eventually, I hope that uh, 
we will begin a dialogue amongst the, the political candidates on our national security strategy. Up to this point, it has been rarely mentioned, if at all. And I think it's time for us to do that. The elements of deterrence are, are complicated. And uh, I would submit that uh, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have as, a, as uh, an institution, I'm talking about the groups that are represented here, uh, is the fact that <clears throat> what's our requirement? That's a rhetorical question. So, Joe, that means you don't have to answer it. Uh, we, uh, I don't know what the requirement is. How many nuclear weapons do we need? Uh, I would submit that uh, I have a number of mine that perhaps we can get down to two or 300 nuclear weapons and maybe we ought to start going there. And many of the problems that have been identified here would just go away. You'd have enough nuclear weapons to deter nuclear weapons. So that's one aspect of it. Number two, uh, how do you deter, if you don't accept my, my premise and you want to go out and and go through this modernization program, uh, how much is enough? Uh, I don't know what that answer is because uh, there's not much, been much in terms of transparency. What, what's our requirement? How many bullets do we need? I don't know. And I have not seen anything that would tell me what the number is. I know in my time uh, at, as a SAC bomber pilot and a planner and commander in chief of strategic command, uh, we had a very rigorous set of methodologies. The president put out a directive. The secretary of defense and his staff put out something called a nuclear weapons employment plan. The joint staff would put out a a JSCAP, a Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan, and all those documents would translate into the Single Integrated Operational Plan, the PSYOP. Well, we don't do that anymore. And we quit doing that in 2013. And so I don't know what the, uh, the current methodology is. And I would recommend that the group, people in this group here consider the following, that is, Throw this, this grenade, if you will, into the arms of the National Academy of Sciences. They, I've been involved in two National Academy's uh, studies, one on prompt global strike and the other on missile defense. And I will tell you, they can go out and assemble a great group of nonpartisan experts and come up with a report that has great credibility. Well, if you went to the National Academy of Science and said, you know, insert language into an appropriations bill that tasks the National Academies to do a study on our nuclear weapon requirements, which would then involve modernization, uh, for the next 30 years. And uh, I am confident that we would come up with some, some uh, good data, good information, and get this... Uh, this dialogue out of the political arena. I, I agree the politics have, have to play a role in this thing, but by the same token, it has become so politicized, nuclear, weapon, nuclear modernization, and it's unaffordable, obviously, uh, that uh, we need to do something. And business as usual just ain't gonna work. And that's why I would submit getting the National Academies involved would be the right thing to do. And as a side note, Back in uh, the early 90s, I was a very strong advocate for uh, getting out of the mode of only building 21 B2s. If you th think back, and I don't remember what the exact number was, but it was 180 or so B2s were on the initial, initial uh, tab for not modernization of our bomber force. If we had gone and built 182 or 150 or whatever, we would have solved a big portion of the problem we face today. But the politicians said, no, you can only build a very small number. And as I became the sink at Stratcom, uh, 
uh, I made a big deal of the fact that if you want to have a bomber around for 40 or 50 years, uh, you can't get by with just 21 airplanes. We've already lost one. And, you know, just by virtue of attrition, crashes, fires, that sort of thing, we're going to lose more, and that's going to further dig into our, uh, into our, uh, our capabilities. And the last thing I'll say is that, uh, well, I respect, and I haven't had a chance to study the report, <clears throat> you know, why do we need a triad? That's another rhetorical question. Uh, why can't we do a, tie, a dyad? Uh, if you get rid of the bomber force, the, the stealth bomber goes away. If you get rid of the, and I, I talk about getting rid of the bomber force, I'm talking about not modernizing the bomber force. If you eliminated the uh, sea launch ballistic missile force, you wouldn't have to build uh, uh, more ballistic missile uh, submarines in the future. These are the kinds of issues that I think ought to become part of the debate. And I firmly believe that uh, a study by the National Academies would put a lot of this in perspective. Thank you. T Todd, you just released a, a major report through CSIS that discusses the quantity and the scale of the conventional weapons modernization, bow wave, as you call it. Uh, are these conventional systems in tension with nuclear modernization? To what extent are they likely to crowd each other out? And how do you see the, f the services prioritizing these different priorities? Yeah, well, um, well, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me here, and I want to congratulate all of you uh, on releasing the report. I know how hard it is uh, to put together <laughs> reports like this, so, you know, Larry and Adam, and I see Kate out there as well. I know she worked hard on it, too. Um, and so, you know, congratulations on that. Uh, to get right to the point, though, um, I think there absolutely is a tension between modernizing conventional forces and nuclear forces. Uh, and that's why the report I just put out, I put them all together. It is part of one big bow wave. Uh, I don't think you can actually consider nuclear modernization in isolation uh, for several reasons. One reason uh, is many of the big ticket systems are dual use. Uh, so the bomber, the LRSB program, the new bomber, uh, that is a dual use system. Uh, and so, you know, you get into the, the counting problem of, well, how much of the cost do we attribute to the nuclear mission versus the conventional mission? If you talk to the Air Force, they would say, well, you know, even if it had no nuclear mission, we'd still buy the bomber because we need to replace the B-52s. Um, you know, how do you count that? Uh, and then if you go even deeper and you look at supporting capabilities like the tanker, uh, well, the tanker does support nuclear missions, also supports conventional missions. How do you count that? The bottom line, though, is this is all in the same budget. <laughs> this all falls under the national defense budget, whether it's in NNSA, which is part of Department of Energy, uh, or if it's in DOD, it is all part of the defense budget cap under the Budget Control Act. So a dollar spent in one area is inherently coming at the expense of a dollar spent in another area. So it is all part of one big bow wave. So I think we have to consider it all together. Um, you know, in my report, I don't make any recommendations about what people should do. Um, you know, I, I leave the hard work like that uh, to smarter people like you. Uh, so I congratulate you for actually putting in some thoughtful recommendations. I don't endorse, you know, one plan or the other, uh, but I do endorse the fact that we need to have a healthy debate about the choices because there are real choices uh, available here. Um, it comes down to strategic priorities. Uh, you know, like I said before, you know, every dollar we spend on a nuclear program is a dollar we can't spend on something else in the budget and vice versa. So these are real trade-offs. Uh, we've got to recognize that. Now, just yesterday, uh, SecDef Ash Carter gave a budget preview. And the real theme of that budget preview uh, was the, the trade-off between uh, future capabilities uh, and current capacity. This is part of that debate. This is part of the capability versus capacity debate, right? And what are we going to have available in the future? Um, and the you know, final point I would make, I love your first recommendation you just talked about uh, of, uh, you know, getting all the data prepared for the next administration. I'm sure as you guys can sympathize, uh, getting data on these costs is like pulling teeth. Uh, the department could do a lot better in terms of data transparency, and they should. 
Uh, and we're not talking about giving out classified information. We're talking about uh, data that they already make available. It is public because they send it to Congress. It's not classified. Uh, it's not even marked F-O-U-O -O for official use only. But they refuse to put it up on their website. And now Frank Kendall, the Undersecretary for Acquisition, he now is talking about classifying even some of that unclassified data uh, to try to keep it out of the hands of adversaries. Uh, so maybe some of us fall into that grouping of adversaries. Um, but this, this is a big thing. I've been very disappointed in this administration that they have, uh, this department and this team uh, has really, uh, you know, been an enemy of transparency uh, in the data that they make available. And, uh, you know, that's something they could really improve on. And I hope the next administration, Republican or a Democratic administration, uh, there's a lot they could do on transparency so that we can actually have a, a healthy, rational, national debate about this, regardless of where you fall uh, on these issues, we ought to at least have access to the good numbers that the department has, and we shouldn't have to spend six months pulling teeth to get the data out of them. As a leading budget analysis analyst, uh, also a bit of a self-serving recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, yeah. if they make the data more accessible, it actually puts me out of a job. <laughs> I think that's unlikely. I think there will always be something to, to find in the defense budget. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Larry, as we wrote this report, you uh, have this, you have a unique perspective and this fascinating perspective on how the existing triad came to be. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the processes involved there. General Habiger mentioned that there was a very rigorous uh, uh, process through which the president set requirements and then they were implemented and, and, and uh, made concrete by DOD and by STRATCOM. Uh, is, is this how we got the arsenal that exists today? <clears throat> well, let me pick up on a point that uh, the general made about the PSYOP, where he's all talk. That was never made available to Congress. Ten years ago in this room, we had Bob Carey, and we spoke about the whole question. And, uh, you know, former Senator, uh, you know, Carey said, I kept asking for the PSYOP so we could make a judgment. It wouldn't give it to me. So that's part of the problem, you know, you have it. And, you know, it, it's interesting. When I, I first got involved, involved in this, I had been a naval flight officer and flying patrol planes. And we used to have dummy nuclear weapons. And we would practice loading them. And I kept asking, hey, where are they? What are the targets? Oh, we can't tell you. Well, you know, you want us to go out and drop a nuclear weapon? I mean, you know, just the whole way in, 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 in which, it, uh, which it came out. And when I started writing, uh, when I, after I got off active duty and I was writing my, uh, my thesis about the role of the military in the budget process, I wrote to a whole bunch of members and, and asked to interview them. And I remember going to see Arlie Burke, uh, Admiral Burke, who if you've ever been in the Navy, I mean, he was, you know, really, the, you know, the, the, the person everybody looked up to. And I said, you know, your predecessor, Admiral Carney, would not put money in the budget for uh, the, the Polaris program. Why did you do it? And he said, two reasons. Number one, I figured the payoff was so great, I was willing to risk the money. The other is the Air Force was getting 50% of the budget. I wanted to get in the game, okay? And so what you see is not somebody saying, oh my goodness, you know, we got, uh, you know, bombers or land-based land missiles. And then, of course, uh, he says, 40 Polaris submarines is enough. For, we don't need anything else. And of course, that didn't go over too well with the other, other, other services, but that's where uh, you know, he came from. And then, if you take a look at how many tubes do we have on the Polaris submarine, if you read Harvey Sapolsky's book, he talks about the fact when they did the analysis, they said they should have 32 tubes on each one. When Admiral Radford, who was uh, Rayburn, who was running the program, briefed that to the submarine community, they said, no, 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 we can't do that. I mean, that's too dangerous, you know, and I hope it's going to work. So we can't live with more than 24. He said, how about 16? OK, fine. And then they supported the program. And then every other country in the world copied us, you know, in terms of the, of the 16. And then when you get to the, the tribes. Lost your mic. Oh, OK. Good. All right, and then when we then when we get to the uh, then when we get to the Tridents, Admiral Rickover wanted to do 16, 
on uh, 16 tubes on each trident. Melvin Laird, who was Secretary of Defense, basically didn't want to build as many tridents because you remember the 70s after Vietnam, the budget was really coming down. So he said uh, 24. And that was it. It wasn't, you know, the analysis or anything. And go back to the point that General Habinger made about the, the bombers. When I came into the Reagan administration, you may remember that the Republicans uh, had criticized President Carter for not going ahead with the B-1. Now, what happened is nobody knew about it because it was classified. You were developing the B-2 that had the stealth technology. And in fact, we don't know about it till Secretary of Defense Harold Brown reveals it at the Democratic Convention. That's the first time people knew about it uh, uh, publicly. So when we got into us, we had to do the study. Well, we said, go with the B-2. You don't want any more B-1s. 244, we recommended, uh, you know, uh, B-2s. The White House said, you can't do that. President Reagan criticized Carter for the B-1. We got to do it. And if you want to go back and see, you know, this political type uh, to type of things, my poor boss, Cap Weinberg, is over there justifying, okay, we're going to do 100 B-1s first before we go to the B-2. And Senator Glenn said, well, wait a second. Why are you, you, why are you going to build the B-1? Well, the B-2 is not ready. And, well, then why do you need the B-2? Well, B-1 won't be able to penetrate Soviet air defenses. Well, how long will then the B-1 work? Three years before, and you know, it was just, so anyway, we go ahead with the B-1, and then of course, the B-2, we don't get it because the Cold War ends and the budget. People forget in the second Reagan administration, we have this thing we now call sequestration, you know, to keep the, uh, keep the budget. So yeah, there are a lot of, uh, of politics, and that's the point we try to make here because you know, as a general scene, you know, it's not supposed to be involved. Yes, it is. And if you go back and you take a look at the, uh, the MX mess, remember we were worried about first strike, they were going to be able to hit the missiles. So we had to make it rotate, you know, put it around. Well, Governor Reagan, who becomes president of all his governors from that part of the country, said, you can't do that. Paul Laxalt is in there. So that was the end of the, of the, of the, uh, of the MX. We didn't, you know, we didn't put it mobile. So this is the point that as we go forward here and you take a look with the analysis, you know, <clears throat> that, uh, <clears throat> that we've tried to do and Todd and the general have talked about, remember that if you don't get control of this thing, you could be victims of politics and end up with the worst of all possible worlds, spending the money and not getting what you want. Good. So, General, let me ask you about this in particular. Does, is STRATCOM aware of or do they uh, attend to uh, budgetary pressures from Congress? Uh, or is that the role of another uh, DOD organization? W what is likely to... So, as Larry mentions, the, the last modernization cycle we went through was highly contentious. And uh, we didn't get the systems that we expected to get. Today, the, the nuclear arsenal is much slimmer. It's much smaller. Uh, we can't make cuts of that magnitude and still going on, still go on doing what we're doing now. Right? The, it would require a fairly major adjustments to nuclear strategy if, for instance, we pare back the, um, the, the production of long-range strike bombers, the B-3, like we did to the B-2. Uh, so, so how would STRATCOM cope with that, um, with that kind of event? Are they planning for it, or uh, what can we do to, to help STRATCOM plan for the future? Well, I think STRATCOM has an adequate planning process in place to look at the future. Yeah. But as a combatant command, their requirement is to uh, ensure warfighting capability. Then it's up to the service, in this case the Air Force, to advocate the, uh, the hardware to do that. And this is where, uh, where I think we have a major disconnect, and that is uh, what the theater or the uh, commander has, theater commander, in this case STRATCOM, and what he needs and uh, what he uh, is going to be funded for. The, the numbers are probably still close, but about uh, four or five percent of our national uh, defense budget is allocated for uh, nuclear 
uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, that's, that's a relatively small percentage for an insurance policy for the United States of America. Uh, to go out and ask for uh, an additional, you know, several billions of dollars uh, does not make much sense. And I think Stratcom is well aware of that. Uh, but it's a, it's a given process where the theater command, combatant commander, makes a, a, a determination. It's then picked up by the service, which then begins the political process. Right. And... Uh, so, so hypothetically, if uh, these plans fall under pressure from Congress, how does Stratcom adjust their planning? <laughs> I mean, is that something that, uh, is there a way to, to make sure that uh, Stratcom is, you know, if, if they, do they have the resources necessary to, to respond to that eventuality? Uh, the closest I can come to give you an answer there is, uh, sure. as we looked at, at getting down to the 2,500 level in the late 90s, uh, uh, we took that that guidance in terms of capability as the gospel coming from the the president. And what we did was we looked at every target in the war plan to determine if we really needed to strike that target. And I personally went through 4,000 individual targets. And I was amazed at how, uh, how many uh, weapons we had allocated to uh, long-range bomber bases mm -hmm. or bases able to accommodate bombers. Well, at the, uh, in 96, 97 time frame, Russia only had 70 operational bombers. Mm -hmm. So why did we have to go out and put nukes on 400 uh, bomber bases? Didn't make any sense. So using that methodology, we got the numbers down to 2,000, 2,500 which later became the 1750 to 2250 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the combatant commanders will look at uh, the guidance they get from the political leadership, and I'm talking about in the, the White House and the uh, uh, OSD, right. to make those kinds of determinations. Uh, gentlemen, uh, General Haberger mentioned uh, this number of, that we spend f about four to five percent of the pe Pentagon budget uh, on, on nuclear weapons. Uh, Todd, you released a report last year uh, that dealt with this number and tried to quantify it. Uh, your determination was that at the peak of the modernization bow wave, uh, it gets to about 5%. Um, we've heard some slightly varying numbers from the Pentagon. I think Brian McKeon said to Congress um, that it would sort of approach 7%. Uh, can you put this number in perspective for us? Uh, is that affordable? Um, you know, where does that stand relative to other line items in the Pentagon budget? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a big part of it is how do you count the, the cost of dual-use systems? Right. So the Pentagon likes to include the full cost of the bomber when they report nuclear costs. Uh, if you include the full cost, then yeah, it's closer to 7% at the peak of the modernization bow wave. If you, if you do partial cost, allocate, you know, a share of the bomber fleet to the nuclear mission, then it's lower. What I found is actually we're at about 3% right now using my methodology, which is all documented in my report. We're at about 3% of national defense budget right now going to nuclear forces. Uh, and then that will rise over time and peak at about 5% and then come back down over time. The question is, is that affordable? Uh, yeah, I think it's affordable. I don't think that's the right question, though. Uh, because, you know, 5% of the budget, yeah, we could allocate an additional 5% of the budget to lots of different things. Um, to put it in perspective, uh, right now we allocate 10% of the budget to health care, military health care, not veterans health care, uh, just military health care. Uh, so, you know, we could allocate 15% of the budget to military health care if we wanted to, and I, we may try, we'll see. Um, but, you know, yeah, you can move money around. Yeah. The bigger question is, is not affordability, is, is our, our spending aligned with our strategic priorities, right? Is this, is this you know, if we're spending 5% on the budget for nuclear forces, you know, at the peak of the bow wave, uh, is that commensurate with the role of nuclear forces uh, in our strategy and our defense posture? So that's really the question, is where do we want to spend the money? Because the reality is, 
you know, we'd never have had an unlimited defense budget. We've always had constraints of one kind or another. Right now, we have constraints set in law with the Budget Control Act. So we've got budget caps and maybe they get adjusted in the future, who knows. Um, but no matter what, you're always gonna have a constrained budget. You will never be able to afford uh, all of the systems that you could possibly want to ensure your security. To paraphrase Bernard Brody, um, no amount of money can buy us absolute security. Uh, so the question is, how much insecurity are we willing to live with? Uh, and how are we going to live with that? Uh, and so th that really puts us back in the situation of we've got to make trades within the budget. We always have to. Uh, between nuclear and conventional forces, between capability and capacity, you know, these are the kind of trades we've got to make, and that's the debate we should be having. Larry, 5%, is that uh, the right way to think about the cost of the nuclear arsenal, and is it worth it? Well, <clears throat> I think the right way to think about it is if I build a ballistic missile submarine, how many conventional submarines can I build or how many <coughs> um, uh, aircraft carriers? I mean, if you take a l that's the way to do it because when you say, oh, 5%, that's not, you know, that much. Well, how much does the F-35 cost, you know, in terms of the percentage of the budget? And that's why I think you really have to take a look, like when we talk about, okay, if you build, you know, you, you can live with 10 ballistic missile submarines, okay? What could you do with that money? I mean, the Navy says they don't have enough ships, and if you've been following the, you know, the presidential debates, that's come up again, you know, the smallest Navy since, you know, before World War I. So those are the type of things I think you have to do. Or, you want to cut 50,000 people from the army to build, you know, so that's really, I think, the debate that we should have. And that's what we try to, uh, you know, that's what we try to do uh, uh, here. Let me uh, pick up on a point that the general made before about, you know, 300 or whatever it is. The Air War College a couple of years ago did a study and they said 311 is all you need <laughs> for deterrence. Now, I don't, you know, I mean, that uh, obviously was the Air War College and people, I assume, you know, knew what they were doing. But that's the type of debate that I think we need. And the other thing that where President Obama got himself boxed in here was in order to get approval for new start levels, he had to promise to modernize the, the triad. So, in effect, people said, you know, we're willing to go down to that, but in order to ratify it, then you're going to have to commit to a, you know, a buildup. And, and again, that puts, you know, that to me is the wrong question. The question is, what do you really need, you know, in, in order to get your deterrence? Todd, several times in the last, uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, major defense acquisition programs have faced cost overruns. Um, the, the nuclear, uh, am, I, am I on thin ice here? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, cost yeah. Overruns. Uh, and so uh, the nuclear bow wave is just getting started, but already, for instance, the B-6112 consolidation program has had its cost estimates expanded dramatically. Uh, is the Pentagon getting better about cost overruns? Are we likely to see them here? Um, so the, the bottom line is cost overruns are a really big risk, I think, in, in uh, the modernization bow wave. So I'm, I've got some numbers here I'll pull up from other people's studies. So a 2008 RAND study uh, found average, average cost growth of 57% uh, in development and 34% in procurement. Uh, average total cost growth, a different RAND study, um, so put development and procurement together, average total cost growth they found in this other study was 46%. And then a little more disturbing uh, is a more recent, a 2014 study uh, by IDA uh, that found a correlation between the magnitude of cost growth and when a program was initiated. So it turns out, uh, there's pretty good statistical evidence of this, that programs that are started when we're in a declining budget environment have much larger cost overruns. Uh, so that's a big problem. So the programs that are really at risk for major cost overruns right now, which as an aside are not included in our cost estimates, right? Because we don't know what the unanticipated cost overrun is yet. Uh, but the programs that are most at risk are the ones that are still early in development. You know, so a program like the F-35 has already had its cost overruns, 51% above the original baseline. Um, you know, B-61 uh, is actually, it's already had a lot of its cost overruns, right? So we're, we're probably near the end of cost overruns with some of those programs. But Ohio replacement, still very early. A lot of risk for cost overruns. Uh, LRSB, 
a lot of risk for cost overruns. LRSO, the cruise missile replacement, is still very early, a lot of risk for cost overruns. And then there's programs that we haven't even really started yet, uh, like the Minuteman replacement, the GBSD, ground-based strategic deterrent. Uh, of course, you know, that's going to be at risk for cost overrun as well. Uh, so there is a lot of risk built into these plans. Now, what happens if you have cost overruns on these programs? And let's just assume that, um, that you know, we just agree to stick with the programs and we'll pay it, right? Uh, which is not a safe assumption. But if you do have cost overruns, I don't think it ends up increasing the peak of the bow wave by very much. What happens is it extends the peak period of the bow wave because when programs have cost overruns, they slow down. We start spreading out the funding. We don't necessarily ramp up the annual amount of funding. We just fund it at that level for longer. Uh, so I think cost overruns, the risk here is that the modernization bow wave gets stretched and we have to stay at a higher level of funding for longer and in the end pay a lot more for programs. That's a big risk though. Interesting. Uh, and, and well, I think that, I, I don't want to ask you that. Uh, General, let me ask you a, a <laughs> one more strategic question. Right. Um, in, the, in the report, uh, we are forced, we were contending with um, both the strategic nuclear systems, so the ICBMs and the submarines, but also uh, non-strategic nuclear systems, uh, including B-6112, um, the long-range standoff weapon, the, the new air launch cruise missile, doesn't really fit into this uh, category, but in some ways uh, it, it does because it's a platform that has to be launched from within theater. Uh, and, and the Air Force's rationale for this is that uh, it's a lower yield warhead than, for instance, an ICBM warhead, and therefore uh, it's, it's more useful for escalation control in sort of regional contingencies. What's your view on um, how we should posture these non-strategic systems and when and where are they necessary for deterrence? Uh, I have some rather strong views on this also. Please. Uh, first of all, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the utility of nuclear weapons has been diminished significantly. Uh, as some of you know, when uh, nuclear weapons were first developed, uh, the accuracy of the delivery platforms was in the uh, uh, tens of hundreds of, of meters. Well, now with a 2,000-pound conventional weapon with a, uh, a GPS guidance system, you can get that weapon to hit within 10 meters of a target, and you're going to have significant damage. So, you know, we haven't transition from the old school think of nuclear weapons and why they're invaluable to modern day conventional weapons. And the other thing that uh, uh, I, I would point out is that uh, tactical nuclear weapons forward deployed is not a military requirement, it's a political requirement. The only reason that we have almost 200 tactical nuclear weapons in, in Europe is because the NATO politicians want those nuclear weapons, period. Makes no sense. And then the other thing we haven't talked about, and I don't want to take a lot of time this morning, but uh, uh, as you get down to lower and lower levels of nuclear weapons, one of the policy issues that you need to address is uh, during the Cold War, we had a counter-value uh, philosophy and a counter-force philosophy. The counter-value was uh, civilian kinds of targets and counter-force was military kinds of targets. Well, as you get down to lower and low, lower levels of nuclear weapons, you can't win a war, if you will, by just employing a uh, counter-force strategy because you don't have enough nuclear weapons to do that. And once the American public or the British public or whomever, start re reading between the lines to see that, wow, we've only got a few hundred nuclear weapons. And when I was pulling alert in a V-52 many years ago, and don't quote me on this, we used to have uh, targets that we studied. And uh, occasionally, not often, but occasionally, we'd have what we called a crowd pleaser. 
It was an obscure, <laughs> obscure chemical factory in the middle of Minsk that, uh, you know, the chemical factory wasn't that vital to the Soviets, but there were a lot of people around that target that uh, would be uh, impacted. Uh, well, with that evocative image, uh, I'd like to <laughs> take questions from the audience to make sure that uh, we can get at the things that you're concerned about. So let's start here. Tell them to identify themselves. Yeah, please identify yourself uh, and phrase a question. Thanks. Hi, Rachel Oswald, reporter with Congressional Quarterly. In thinking about the upcoming um, uh, budget request and then um, as it moves through Congress, do you have any pri priorities on, in terms of, and this is to the report authors, in terms of what you would most want to see opposition to? Would that be the um, cruise missile, the uh, B-61 upgrade, um, further down the line, reducing the subs? I mean, you may not be able to get everything that you're asking for. So, so where should um, uh, advocates of a smaller nuclear arsenal um, focus their energies? Great question. Uh, I think the conventional wisdom is, and I think this is a fair assessment, is that um, political appetite uh, for examining the B-61 on the Hill has sort of diminished, and the program is, is going forward in the appropriations process. And so I think that leaves uh, that program to the, to the presidency and to the White House. Uh, I, I think, in, and if I were going to make a recommendation, I'd say that the Hill ought to take a very close look at the long-range standoff weapon at the new cruise missile program. Uh, I, I'd, I'd recommend to you a, an op-ed by Andy Weber, Weber, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, and uh, Bill Perry in the Washington Post, where they say it's destabilizing and unnecessary. Uh, I, I think that's a debate that we're going to have in the coming year uh, as we move forward with this NDAA process. And I think that's, I think that's the right way to, to look at it. Yeah, I think the key, as Bill Perry and Andy Weber has pointed out, and you know, the bombers dual use, okay? Cruise missiles dual use. But what do I see? If I see a bomber coming in, I might have to assume it's got nuclear weapons, and that could be destab destabilizing. So it's not just, a, I think, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, a fiscal issue. It is a, a very, very big strategic issue, because the last thing you want is somebody to overreact uh, in, this, uh, in this area. And so we don't have perfect cost estimates or excellent cost estimates of, of LRSO, but it's, it might be somewhere in the, in the vicinity of uh, $20 billion plus uh, the program to LEP to life extend the W80-1 uh, warhead for the, for the bomber. And so it's a significant line item that I think uh, Congress is going to take a close look at. Uh, yeah, let's start here in the front row. Uh, James Drew with Flight Global. A lot of opposition uh, to uh, force structure cuts to the nuclear force. Um, the, the main arguments coming out of uh, the Air Force and DOD is that that would be unilateral disarmament. Um, say you were to, to uh, eliminate the B-61-12, uh, the cruise missile, uh, that would be disarming, America disarming itself uh, without any cuts to China or Russia's inventories. Um, how, how do you uh, resolve that? It's a fair question, but if you recall the beginning of the briefing, it's, it's fully possible to meet uh, the New START warhead ceilings uh, and, and to do all of this without eliminating strategic warheads, uh, which are the most capable uh, elements of the nuclear force. Uh, and, and so I'd argue that it's not unilateral disarmament. Uh, there's, there are ways that we can sort of trim uh, our capabilities and our force structure that allow us to keep the same force levels overall, uh, but to save money while doing so. And so for my money, that's, that's a good bet. Uh, it's a fair savings. Um, anybody who else wants to chime in? Well, I, I think, and this goes back to the point that the uh, general made, I mean, really, what do you need to deter, okay, you know, other, other, other people? And, and I think, you know, that, that's really the, the, the key, key issue. And in this report, we stayed away. I mean, there are people who have argued, and I, I, I'm very sympathetic, you know, and the president has mentioned this, why can't you go down to 1,000 nuclear weapons, okay? And don't forget, when we first did this, the arms control agreement, I was reading Kissinger's book and getting ready, you know, when we did this uh, study, we allowed the then Soviet Union to have 
more warheads than we did. And we lived with that for 20 years. So I think that's, you know, something you really need to, to keep in mind. And, and you may remember that uh, Henry, when they pushed him on it, said basically what the blank is strategic superiority and what do you do with it? <laughs> sure, here. Thank you. Dick Klass, retired Air Force Colonel. Um, a comment. I think the most important uh, criteria is not what percent of the budget uh, goes to nuclear systems, but what percent of the procurement in R&D budget is a much better measure uh, than the total budget. But one of the assumptions uh, of the study is we're going to keep the triad. Uh, my question is why, and specifically for General Hebiger, um, if the Air Force were told you can have a new bomber or a modernized ICBM force, but not both, what would they say? I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you bring up some interesting and excellent points. The, uh, and this is a point that I wish I'd made earlier. The services, the combatant commanders, would do what the president says. And not a lot of people are aware because it was just brought into the public uh, arena about three years ago with an excellent uh, uh, Na National Defense University uh, paper about how uh, President Bush, Bush won, and uh, Brent Scrocroft in the Oval Office, virtually by themselves, came up with a plan to bring all of our bombers off alert. I mean, that was addressed with, with uh, uh, Colin Powell and virtually no one on the Joint Staff. And they came down and said, Air Force, we will take all your bombers and tankers off alert. Well, it was done. No one complained about it. And that's the way we're going to get things done in the nuclear arena is for the big guy, the big kahuna, to say, do it. And when that happens, things will get done. Until that time, you're going to have posturing and waving of arms and uh, a lot of politics involved. So, Let me just address the percentage of the budget question. Um, I, I was l quoting it as a percentage of the total budget because within that 5%, there are a lot of non-procurement uh, and RDT&E cost. I'm including in that uh, the operation and maintenance cost of nuclear forces, uh, support for the bases that have nuclear missions, uh, and the military personnel assigned to work uh, the nuclear missions as well. So it's including the O&M, MILPERS, MILCON, all of that, not just procurement and RDT&E. Uh, but procurement and RDT&E is a big part of it right now, and that's where the big increase is coming because of the bow wave. Uh, of trying to modernize all the legs of the triad plus some uh, at the same time. And you know, it's important to keep in mind that the reason that we, under the Eisenhower administration, emphasize nuclear weapons is because of the large conventional advantage that the, the Soviet uh, you know, mil military had. Well, right now, whatever else you may think, our military conventionally is better than anybody else in the, uh, uh, in the world. So then you get back to, do you need it? And the other thing about the targets, I had the privilege of working for Admiral Turner when I was at the Navy War College, and we stayed friendly. And then he took over the Second Fleet, and they used to keep everything segregated. So he's commander of the Second Fleet. There were nuclear weapons on there, so he called the pilots in, and he said, what's your target? So we can't tell you. You know, that's, you know, classified or, you know, uh, uh, I'm in trouble with this thing. Anyway, so uh, basically, Finally, he pressed them, and they. And this is what he told me, that they were going to drop two nuclear weapons on a bridge in Bulgaria. So this gets to the whole question of, you know, and, you know, remember, we ended up like with 27,000, you know, by the time we started with the arms control negotiations. Uh, sure, right here. Uh, Major David Mather, I'm uh, currently at NNSA. Is this on? Um, General Haberger, sir, you were at, uh, uh, in your earlier comments, were talking about uh, how getting down to uh, 
uh, 300 weapons would be, you know, perhaps a good level, and uh, uh, and 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 that doing so. Uh, excuse me, we'll get back up. Um, so when we start talking about uh, the, the the point of nuclear weapons is to deter, to deter nuclear weapons, something that you had mentioned. Um, I think of it in two kind of buckets. You know, one of them is is escalation control, which we've mentioned, and the other one is to uh, deter other countries from building nuclear weapons. You know, the the goal being fewer nuclear weapons in the world, right? So, uh, uh, at what point do you start being concerned about either a rush to parity from from China? or allies who are no longer confident with the nuclear umbrella deciding to build their own arsenal? Uh, is, is there a level, say, between here and 300 or lower, where that becomes a concern, and what sort of mechanism do you put in place to manage that? Well, excellent question. When you go back to uh, your headquarters, say hello to uh, Frank and to Madeline. I know them well. Uh, and tell them you ask an excellent question. <laughs> so you need to tell them that. <laughs> uh, something I've advocated for many years is that uh, we have been on a glide path to get to lower and lower levels of nuclear weapons for many years. And the longer we were at it and the lower we got the numbers, the more comfortable the politicians felt, the, the public felt about where we were going. Uh, and we're still on that glide path, and I think it's a good glide path. Uh, when do we get to uh, uh, to 300? And the 300 just something I, you know, it's my intuitive uh, thinking that we came up with that number. But when do we get to that number? I don't know. But sooner rather than later. And there's a lot of things that we need to do in the meantime. Uh, Sam Nunn and I argue every time we're around each other about hair trigger alert. Well, I don't think it's hair trigger alert, but uh, uh, we need to bring the alert status down of our ICBMs. Uh, we've been dealing with that for many, many decades. And I was a, a major when we, I remember first dealing with uh, that. And again, it's one of those things where the services are not going to do anything until the big kahuna says, take your missiles off alert. And then by golly, Within hours, the missiles and the subs will be off alert. And that's, uh, we need to get down to lower and lower levels. We need to have support and big decisions from the people in the White House to make it all happen. I think this is a critical point, and it's why we highlighted in the report uh, the, necessary, the necessity of the president uh, considering and reviewing the nuclear employment guidance. Uh, you hear the services defending the modernization plans uh, because that's their jobs. They're required to. Uh, and that's what they ought to be doing. Uh, but the requirements come from the president, and it's really only the, the president that can decide to change them. Uh, and it's really only the president, therefore, that can decide to um, change the nuclear modernization plans. So this is why we're trying to emphasize uh, the importance of doing this doing a nuclear posture review in the next administration, including and taking a holistic look at uh, the modernization plans. But also, in the meantime, President Obama should understand um, what his requirements are doing to the nuclear force. And before he takes office, to sort of take another look at that and see uh, whether he's leaving the right legacy for the next president. Uh, yeah, so other questions? Yeah, so, so we have built into the arsenal uh, a rather significant hedge. Um, we have a large uh, stockpile of non-deployed warheads that can be uploaded um, to, to existing weapons platforms in the case of a crisis. Uh, um, I, I, I think that we're going to maintain that capability. Uh, it's not necessary to sort of improve that capability uh, because Russia has, has been complying with the New START Treaty. It's been doing so admirably, and we're and we're delighted that they are. Uh, and China has historically had a very, um, in some ways, a very moderate um, nuclear posture. They are modernizing their delivery vehicles. Uh, they're building new warheads, but they do so at very low numbers and very gradually. Uh, so it's always possible that things could uh, change dramatically in the future. Uh, I think the US nuclear force is prepared to do that. And, no and none of the, um, 
and, and none of the uh, recommendations that we make in this report in any way attrite our ability to hedge or to upload later. Uh, and, and so I think it's right to, to maintain some capability there. Uh, I, I think our sort of non-deployed stockpile is, my own personal preference is that it's larger than it probably needs to be. Um, but, but the long and short of it is that we do have that capability and, and we'll maintain it. Yeah, since you raised that question, it's important to keep in mind, we still haven't ratified CTBT. And you know, this is something I think really should be on our agenda. And aside from you know, the, the other questions we've raised here today, the fact that you're starting this massive rebuilding of your nuclear forces, it's interesting to look at the comments. You know, the Chinese have said they're very upset about the uh, air launch cruise missile. They saw it. And the North Koreans, when they did their recent tests, said, well, you guys are ha undergoing a trillion dollar <laughs> modernization, you know, uh, plan. Uh, and, you know, I mean, those are things that I think the perception around the world if we're going to play this leadership role in diminishing the, the role of nuclear weapons, it becomes tough when people see trillion dollar, you know, uh, nuclear modernization program. Hi, my name is Kyle Fowler. I'm also with NNSA. I've sure got a uh, two-part question about your proposal uh, regarding the air breathing leg of the triad. Uh, you propose pulling the B-61 out of Europe, um, but I would argue that one of the uh, one of the strengths of that leg of the triad, uh, what what it's useful for, is its uh, visibility and usefulness for signaling and uh, reassuring our allies. So with that mission uh, eliminated or at least significantly diminished by pulling them out of Europe, what do you see as the enduring mission of the B-61 uh, and the bomber leg of the triad? And then the second part of the question is, if there is an enduring mission that's very important and offers something the other two legs of the triad don't, uh, won't there still need to be some kind of modernization plan, uh, even if it doesn't look like the B-61-12 consolidation? Um, that needs to take place, and how does that factor into your plans for savings on the uh, modernization? So yeah, excellent question. So I, I think I'll let Gen General Haberger address the mission uh, for the for the bomber fleet. But uh, with respect to the to plans that we're proposing, uh, as you say, uh, public reports say it's about 180 uh, warheads stationed in Europe. Um, the public reports also suggest that they're at relatively low readiness, um, and so. The, the question is, is the capability worth $28.8 billion? In the United States, we're not very good at um, getting our heads around these numbers, sort of having intuitive sense of what else you can buy with that amount of money, and asking the question, is the capability worth the price tag? I, th I think those are very expensive uh, bombs with not a lot of uh, strategic deterrent value. The question is, do they have assurance value? Uh, you'll hear differing opinions. Uh, some people say that, uh, that, that NATO wants them, uh, that NATO sort of needs them to maintain it, to, to remain as a nuclear alliance. Uh, I, I, my understanding is that uh, the alliance is in some ways split. There are some countries that think it's a valuable asset and some countries that wish they were gone. Uh, so in some ways they sort of just, they detract attention uh, and detract from alliance cohesion in deterring against the Russian threat. And so we saw the President uh, and, and the Pentagon announce a couple of days ago that they're uh, something like quadrupling the number of uh, the funding available to, to maintain four deployed forces in Europe. And I think that's the right way to go. I think that's a much more visible uh, uh, capability. I, I think those are the systems that we need to deter Russia. I don't think we would ever use the tactical uh, DCA, the tactical systems that are deployed in Europe. Um, I, I just can't imagine this president, a U.S. president, providing release authority to a European pilot to drop a, a U.S. Uh, munition. Uh, so we don't uh, recommend in this report withdrawing them immediately. Uh, it's a step that I'd be willing to, uh, to, to follow. Uh, but the point is, canceling the B-61 LEP um, allows you to have a bomber capability over the future. Um, they can. Uh, U.S. strategic bombers can continue to carry uh, B-61-7s uh, and also B-83s for the next several years. Uh, and, you know, you still have a strike capability through the, uh, the JASM, the uh, conventional advanced cruise missile. And so, 
you know, it, it doesn't do away with our uh, bomber strike capabilities, um, but it saves a great deal of money. And, uh, you know, if you didn't want to withdraw them right away, if you felt like it wasn't the right time, uh, it's entirely plausible to, to cancel the LEP and, and sort of suggest that we're likely to phase out these capabilities in the long run. But to maintain the, the weapons in situ for uh, several years and then withdraw them at an advantageous moment. So uh, I, I don't think it's a, it's a radical step. I, I think the, uh, the capability is just not worth the price tag. Uh, so General, do you, what's your view on the bomber mission? He did a masterful job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, does that cover your? Yeah. Of the B-61, and if there isn't one, are you proposing moving to a dyad once they're withdrawn? Uh, no, we're not here proposing mo moving to a dyad. Uh, as we say, strategic bombers can still carry the Dash 7 uh, and the B-83. Uh, strategic bombers can also, um, you know, maintain their signaling and, and deterrence uh, capabilities. So uh, we're not recommending cutting the bomber force, no. And, and Bill Perry's new book, he recommends going to a dyad. But a different dyad. Yes. <laughs> but, but the question here is, uh, oh, I lost the frame of my own question. <laughs> uh, you want to go to the next yeah, question while we take, there. A, take another question. <clears throat> Hi, Joe Kendall, Stimson Center. Um, I was just wondering if I could get some of your thoughts on low-yield nuclear weapons going forward. Um, they obviously got shut down during the Bush administration, but they seem to be coming back into uh, popular discussion a little bit. Yeah, yeah, there is a, a something of a, a um, fad of of reconsidering these proposals. Uh, in in my view, it's it's essentially warmed over Cold War thinking. Uh, the argument that's proposed by some very smart and very thoughtful analysts uh, is that if, if we don't develop new capabilities and very low yield uh, strike options, uh, Russia will feel emboldened to use their tactical nuclear systems and it'll leave gaps in our deterrence. Uh, again, I think it's not worth the price. It's not worth the political cost, the diplomatic cost, right? We've got a new uh, NPT review conference coming up that the next president is going to have to deal with in their first a couple of uh, years in office. And it would be devastating, a devastating signal to our allies. It would be devastating to, uh, uh, to our leadership as on non-proliferation problems to say, we need these systems. We need new systems. The strongest conventional military in the world can't meet its own security requirements without building new nuclear weapons. I, I think it would increase pr proliferation pressures around the world. Uh, cost more money and not get us a great deal in terms of deterrent value at all. Uh, I have very strong views on this. Uh, I, I can refer to you to a uh, uh, House Armed Services Strategic Forces Subcommittee hearing uh, at which I testified with a number of folks, um, including Barry Blackman, um, maybe two or three months ago that has, it, it's, a, it's a deeper look at that question. Uh, I just want to please, I'd love to yeah, hear. Yeah, just let me say that uh, nuclear weapons have such a negative connotation. Uh, I cannot, personally, I cannot conceive of a scenario where we use nuclear weapons unless uh, they were used against us by another uh, major power, uh, nuclear power. Uh, the hue and cry, I mean, we've used nuclear weapons twice. We have, the United States, no one else has. And the... Uh, we're still living with that legacy today. Every August in Japan. And I just cannot, as I said, conceive that we would use nuclear weapons if there were other options available. And in my view, there are other options available. And I would just add to that, I fully agree, we're not going to use nuclear weapons as a first strike weapon. Uh, it would only be in a second strike situation. So then, Let's follow that logic. That means that what we actually need in our nuclear arsenal is an assured second strike capability. That's how you get deterrence. Um, so what gives us that assured second strike capability? Uh, you know, it's not a missile sink. Um, you know, it may not even be bombers. I think it's the undersea leg that actually gives us that secure second strike capability. So if we're talking about what choices to make, you know, there's a, a basis for prioritization. 
Um, but going even further, I, I'll tell you that recently you know, we did some tabletop um, wargaming type exercises at CSIS and we were looking at how you would make budget trades in a constrained environment. And we gave the participants uh, a scenario where there was a limited nuclear strike uh, against you know, either us or one of our allies without naming the countries involved. Um, I can tell you that the whole group there really struggled with what to do. Uh, because you start thinking about, well, if there was, you know, a small, you know, nuclear device used, say, against a close ally of ours, maybe some of our forces were hit, how do you respond? And you start going down the list, and actually, it may be a conventional response. Uh, as terrible as that is, that, you know, a, a nuke would be used against us or our allies, the best, the most effective response may not be a nuclear weapon. Uh, depending on the circumstances. So yeah, that's something we have to think about as well. We've got a, a real advantage uh, in conventional attack, uh, and I hope we maintain that advantage into the future. Uh, but, you know, you think of the target sets that we used to have, like, you know, hitting, you know, air bases that might possibly be used for bombers or hitting bridges. A nuclear weapon is not the best weapon to use against that now. A more effective weapon would be a precision-guided uh, conventional munition. I mean, you know, even setting aside all taboos about nuclear weapons, uh, you know, precision-guided munitions and the huge advantage that we have there uh, have really, you know, obviated the need for some of these weapons in some situations. Not completely. There are still different types of targets and different types of scenarios where you would have to go nuclear. Um, but we do have to rethink the, the mix of weapons that we have and the actual operational plans and how we would use these and, and think through the chess game of if someone did this, what would we do in response? It's, and I, I think from our experience in that tabletop exercise at CSIS, uh, I think that the defense community uh, has got a lot of work to do there, that we really, everyone struggled uh, with this issue of what to do. And there was a lot of debate and not, a, not consensus. Uh, and I think there needs to be more work in that area. You know, and I, I think it's interesting when 10 years ago when we did this, we had Robert McNamara come here and he's saying, Bill Perry saying the same things he did. So I think when people are not, you know, involved in it and they can take a more dispassionate look, they, they recognize, you know, with the nuclear weapons. And, you know, you were talking about uh, the first President Bush and Brent Scowcroft. In addition <clears throat> to what you mentioned, they also took the nuclear cruise missiles off the ships. The people were thrilled. They didn't even like having them on there, you know, in, in terms. And that's the point I try to make when I kept saying, when, who, who are we going to drop these on? And they would never tell us. You know, and the idea that somehow or another you'd be dropping a, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. So I think that, you know, really when you get down to it and the general made, yeah, we used them twice, but it's almost inconceivable to figure, you know, when you might do it again unless you, it was a second strike capability. <clears throat> yeah, let me just add that uh, uh, the... Uh, utility of nuclear weapons, as I've mentioned before, has been so, so discounted that uh, it makes absolutely no sense. Precision guided munitions are become the wave of the future. And for you media people out there, I'm just appalled that there has been more written about carpet bombing by Russian airplanes over Syria. Carpet bombing? That's Vietnam era stuff. If the Russians have no better technology than using uh, internal uh, navigation systems on their bombers to drop weapons when there are people around, uh, they are a, almost a third world country. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. Uh, can we go in the back here uh, to the woman in the blue? In North Tamara with the House Armed Services Committee. Um, I had a question following up on a comment by Adam, um, but it's actually a question for General Habiger. Uh, given that we've got mul multiple layers of hedge, we've got the deployed and non-deployed, we've got the triad, we've got several warheads or bombs per um, per leg of the triad. We've got um, 
pits at Pantex, we've got a responsive infrastructure. Um, so given that we've got several layers um, uh, of hedge, how does um, Stratcom set priorities? Since, since they don't pay, the services have to pay for um, nuclear monetization, uh, but Stratcom sets the military requirements. How does Stratcom um, set what is a must-have versus a nice-to-have in terms of um, the nuclear deterrent and modernization? That's an excellent question. It gets back to my uh, uh, initial proposal that someone on the Hill put language uh, in an appropriations bill for National Academies of Sciences to look at the strategic reserve of uh, the pits or the weapons and then the, the, the standby reserve. Uh, when I was at Stratcom, I was appalled at the numbers of weapons in the second and third tier uh, stockpiles. I mean, they were astounding, many thousand. Now, did I get the vote? Yeah, I signed a piece of paper that went back to the Secretary of Energy and Secretary of Defense saying I agreed with them. But, you know, perhaps this is something that can be brought to greater transparency because I think it's grossly overestimated. And, uh, you know, in, in my view, the Stratcom commander is looking at his capability to carry out the operational plan that he has on the shelf today and uh, doesn't think much more of it than, than that. All right, well, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out on a rainy day and uh, to encourage you to pick up a report on your way out. And uh, thanks for being with us.